There's a passage where the Buddha says that there are ways of overcoming anger. It starts out by saying, this person has done something bad to me that I don't like, but what should I expect? This person is doing something bad to me now, what should I expect? This person will do something bad to me, but what should I expect? This person has harmed people that I love, but what should I expect? You get the message. You know, have harmed, are harming, will harm people you love. They're doing nice things to people you don't like. They have done in the past and they will do in the future. In every case, what should you expect? This is the way it is with the human world. It's not designed toward, to appeal to our likes and dislikes. or to go the way we want it to. We live in a world where there's a lot of stuff going the way we don't want it to. So we have to look at our anger. Anger often presents itself as being justified, that someone has done something outrageous or said something outrageous. It's beyond the pale. It can't be. You can't stand it. And that right there is the crux of the problem lack of endurance, and an inability to take the larger picture. Seeing a given that people will do things you don't like, how can you live in this world in a skillful way, not let your anger take over? Seeing things in that way is half the battle right there, because a lot of people really like their anger. I feel that this is how you get things done in the world, by getting angry. This is how you protect yourself, they say, by getting angry. But it's a very weak protection, because you'd end up saying a lot of things and doing a lot of things that you're going to later regret. So it's only a short stopgap measure. So learn to look at your anger, as the Buddha said, as something separate, something you want to stand apart from. To learn to understand it. It's one of the reasons why we meditate. We get used to looking at things in the mind in terms of the different kinds of fabrication. Bodily fabrication, verbal, mental. Bodily fabrication being the in and out breath. Verbal being Directed thought and evaluation, the way you talk to yourself, and mental perceptions, mental labels, acts of recognition, acts of imaging things to yourself, and then feelings. We use these things to create a st state of concentration. But then as you go through the day, you begin to notice that you're using these same three things to create states of becoming in the mind. And a state of anger is a very particular kind of becoming. It's strange. It gives you a sense of freedom, certain constraints, things you would never in your right mind think of doing or saying. You suddenly feel that you have the right to do or say those things. You feel released. What's happened, though, is you've got blinders. Your sense of shame gets blinded. Your sense of compunction, thinking about the consequences of your action, that gets blinded too. It's like a drug. It impairs your faculties, and yet you think it's actually expanding them. So you've got to realize that it's like a straitjacket. You breathe in a certain way that makes you feel really uncomfortable. You've got to get something out of your system. You talk to yourself in ways that justify again and again and again why you should be angry about that person. Because after all, they did say these things. It's true. And then the perceptions you hold in mind, the big one being that you can't stand it. And there are good reasons why you can't stand it. And you add up all the reasons and all the little frustrations and other things that have gone into the day in the past week or whatever, all come piling on at the same time. 
So of course there's going to be pain in the body, pain in the mind. And you lash out. And even if you don't lash out physically, there can be some verbal exchanges. And then you've got karma. You've got to keep thinking about that all the time. What kind of life are you creating for yourself if you keep on acting on anger? The Buddha said, for one, one thing, you make yourself ugly. You end up destroying things that have value. You can destroy friendships very easily that way. You can destroy, destroy things physically. And you say and do things that at the moment you think are really clever, but then you reflect on them later and you realize you've done a lot of harm. So as I said, the first order of business is to see anger as something that's really harmful. The voice that says, well, how are you going to get things done in the world? How are you going to change things that need to be changed? There's lots of ways you can make change without having to be angry about it. In fact, when you can think more calmly and clearly about things, you're more likely to come up with an effective idea of what should be done. So look at your anger in terms of those three kinds of fabrication and replace them. Breathe in new ways. Breathe in a calm way to calm yourself down. This way you avoid bottling the anger up. Many people are afraid of not expressing their anger because they're afraid they're going to get sick. That's because they don't know how to release the energy of the anger in a skillful way. You can breathe right through it. Notice where the tightness is in your stomach, the tightness in your chest, the tightness in your hands and feet. Relax it. Breathe through it. Breathe through it. And that takes a lot of the oppressiveness of the anger away. And then ask yourself, how are you talking to yourself about this? That passage from the Buddha, what should I expect? After all, this is the human realm. People do all, do all kinds of things in the human realm. And anger is not going to solve the problem. It's clarity that's going to solve the problem, and that doesn't come with anger. Because you want to maintain your sense of shame and your sense of compunction. That you wouldn't do things that you'd be ashamed to reflect on afterwards. And you wouldn't do things that would cause harm down the line. So you've got to talk to yourself in a new way. The Buddha has you reflect on the fact that the people who make you angry, if they have done good things in the past, well, think about that. Think about their virtues. Think about their generosity. Think about their good side. So your response is not one-sided, because that's the problem with anger. It looks at things from one side. It's like a one-eyed beast. It has no perspective. When you bring in two eyes, Look at the good side and the bad side of the person. Then it's a lot easier to think of what would be the right way to respond. And if you can't find anything good in that person at all, then you have to have compassion. If this person's really digging a hole for himself or herself, and Buddha says, regard that person as someone who's sick, lying out in the desert with no help at all. And no matter who it is, stranger or whatever, you you kind of feel some compassion. That's the right attitude. That then sloughs over into the mental fabrication of what perceptions you're holding about that person. Is the person a beast? And your perception about what you can stand and cannot stand. You've got to change that perception. You can't stand it when people say things about you that are insulting, that seem to be pulling you down. Remind yourself you are not pulled up or down by people's words. The Buddha sometimes has you think about the different parts of the body. It's okay, which part of the body is being insulted? How does it feel? And how are your bones feeling about this? The bones don't care. You just tell yourself, well, they don't care, why should I care? And then you remember the Buddha's instructions. People say something really insulting, just tell yourself, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear and 
drop it there. Usually we don't drop it. We're the ones who pull it in and it reverberates in the mind. We embroider it. Why does that person think this about me? Why, how can that person say these things about me? And it goes on and on and on. And you're suffering not from the person's words, but you're suffering from what you're thinking to yourself. So think in new ways. Let the sound stop at the ear. When you approach the anger in this way, taking it apart, then you can reassemble a better state of mind, a state of mind that's clearer, much more able to think about what would be the right thing to do. Remember, even in war, it's the people who can keep their heads that can strategize properly. And that's when people are being killed and things are being destroyed horribly. So how much more so when it's simply a matter of think people doing things that you feel are wrong. It hasn't gotten to the state of warfare yet. You still want to keep your head so you can figure out what would be the best thing to do. Because you can do unskillful things and then it gets thrown right back at you. So learn how to take your anger apart. And you find that it doesn't have that power over you that it has had in the past. And you actually find that you're relieved to be free of that power. So you're not being a wimp. You're not being weak. You're showing forbearance. You're showing equanimity. You're showing patience. And it's when you have these virtues that you can see clearly what does and doesn't need to be said or done. And the more clarity you can bring to situations like that, the better it is for everybody around.